Dear colleagues, dear students, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on wherever you are. My name is Aisha Challer. I'm a professor at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at University of Vienna, and I'm a permanent fellow at the uh, Institute for Human Sciences, IWM. And our team at seminar series is Anna Chukovic, PhD student in anthropology, and Clement Schmidt, MA student again in anthropology, who is also providing us valuable technical assistance. We want to, both all of us, want to welcome you to this month's seminar series on forced migration, as we welcome Professor Nergis Janefe from York University, who will be giving a talk titled Decolonizing Forced Migration Studies, Lessons from Borderlands. The seminar series on forced migration is part of Europe Asia research platform on forced migration at IWM and Mahanirban Calcutta Research Group, CRG. And the seminar series is uh, hosted at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Vienna in collaboration with CRG and IWM. Europe Asia Research Platform on Forced Migration advances the cooperation between European and South Asian institutions, academics, while working towards creating a joint research platform for innovative knowledge production on forced migration and bordering regimes. Bringing together scholars, policymakers, and practitioners from different disciplines and regions, the seminar series aspires to decentering and decolonizing scholarship, debates and policies on forced migration. Before uh, introducing our speaker for today, let me just remind you uh, one or two housekeeping uh, rules that at the end, we will have that the, the, at the end of uh, Nargis Janepe's talks, we will take the questions, we will open the floor for questions, but please use the chat function for your questions. And it might be the case that because of time restrictions, we might end up uh, uh, gathering uh, uh, questions come some of your questions together and if we would not be able to pick up every question so please excuse us for the because of the time limitations but let me now introduce our speaker for today professor nergis janefe is a scholar of public international law comparative politics forced migration studies and critical human rights she has held posts in several European and Turkish universities and is a faculty member at York University, Canada since 2003. She is the co-editor of Journal of Conflict Transformation and Security. She is a frequent public speaker on issues related to human rights, minority rights and historical injustices. Her research experience includes working with the Muslim and Jewish diasporas in Europe and North America, refugees and displaced peoples in Turkey, Cyprus, India, Uganda, South Africa, Bosnia and Colombia. She worked as the Associate Director of Center for Refugee Studies, York University between 2008, 2013 and has done extensive field work on the role of political violence and forced migration in post-imperial nation state formation and capital accumulation in the Middle East. Professor Janefe also regularly conducts some of her human rights, minority rights and refugee rights related work on, on, on a pro bono basis. I would like to underline this also. She acts as an expert witness and public lecturer on subjects related to forced migration, diasporas in exile, minority rights, and genocide in international and Canadian media, Canadian courts, and Canadian and Turkish 
public services. Nargis Jennifer penned close to 100 scholarly articles and several books, including Transitional Justice and Forced Migration, an edited volume which came in 2019, Cambridge University Press, The Syrian Exodus, a monograph in, which came in 2018 from Bilgi University, Istanbul, The Jewish Diaspora as a Paradigm, Politics, Religion and Belonging, uh, an edited volume from 2014. Her most recent work is Limits of Universal Jurisdiction, a critical debate on crimes against humanity, University of Wales International Law Series, which is in press, to be followed by a volume on unorthodox minorities in the Middle East from Lexington Press and comparative politics of administrative law in the Middle East coming from Macmillan publishers. Um, I would like to also underline uh, Nargis Jennifer is also a trained artist and her designs and murals have been showcased regularly since 2018. Um, I have known Nargis work for a long time. Uh, Nargis is a colleague and a friend, old colleague and a friend, but I didn't know this art aspect of her work. Thank you, Professor Jennifer, for accepting our invitation and for joining us today. We are very much looking forward to your talk, which I think goes at the heart of what we are trying to uh, establish also with through our research platform. Welcome, the floor is yours. Nice. Thank you very much. This was a very generous introduction. And it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to share some of my ideas uh, with this esteemed uh, audience, uh, as well as yourself and your colleagues at the center. Um, so what I'd like to do today is share with you uh, parts of um, work that will be included um, both um, in the new book that I'm penning right now on unorthodox minorities in the Middle East, but also um, I am working on uh, an open access source uh, called Ethics of Witnessing, which is to be accessed by uh, students and scholars of forced migration, and in general, people who work with uh, different forms of systemic human suffering. So the decolonizing um, as methodology, as method, is an essential part of that conversation that I am um, taking a part in. And, and no doubt this is going to be a debate that will be growing in significance in forced migration studies. So if you would permit me, I'd like to start this presentation with uh, some of the experiences um, that shape our lives in our home institutions in North America, in my particular case, in the Canadian context. Following the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's 2015 calls to action, Canadian universities and colleges have felt significant pressure to indigenize their institutions. And, and currently I am taking part in some of the committees and subcommittees as well as curricular bodies and reform bodies in my home institution at a pan-university level, meaning it's not just my department, but it's something <clears throat> that is taking place across uh, the departments and faculties. And what indigenization has looked like and what um, the constituencies that are involved in these uh, reform and, and restructuring practices expected to become um, has varied significance uh, for different parts of the public. So um, one of the concerns that emerged in this context of reform and restructuring of uh, curriculum and university programs um, can be discussed um, in, the, in, the, in the spectrum of a three-part act. So if we think of it as on the one hand, um, we could concentrate on indigenous inclusion. If in the middle we have reconciliation related indigenization of curriculum and the institution, only at the very far end we see what is the subject matter of my talk today, 
which is uh, decolonization as method and decolonial indigenization in the Canadian context. So what we witness <clears throat> in, in, in my university and elsewhere, and this is not your specific experience, but this is actually across the board, across provinces, um, in the larger Canadian context, despite using, utilizing, and formulating and adjudicating a very reconciliatory language, the majority of post-secondary institutions in the Canadian context focus prim prim primarily on Indigenous inclusion aspect of um, <clears throat> the decolonization um, trajectory, and, and, and not so much on structural change and curriculum interventions. So policy and practice, which are related to treaty-based decolonial indigenization, are yet to be entering the core academic parlance, other than some of the marginal aspects of established fields. The main issue um, is how to ethically engage indigenous communities and indigenous knowledge um, and indigenous systems of learning and practice with existing institutional status quo um, that leads to knowledge production and dissemination. And that remains as a question rather than uh, a practice that corresponds to an answer. So conceptually, indigenization um, is a kin debate to decolonization. And that's why I wanted to start with the Canadian experience, so to speak, because this is something that I'm going through firsthand uh, among other colleagues and, and students and, and, and larger public um, <clears throat> in, the, um, in the immediate context. So conceptually, indigenization amounts to a move uh, to expand the academy's current conceptions of knowledge and to include other perspectives in transformative ways. Um, however, what exactly this transformation would look like in practice as I said, is a matter of very heated debate. Many indigenous scholars, for instance, argue uh, for an indigenization that provokes a foundational and structural shif shift in academia, uh, including knowledge production, requiring the wholesale overhaul of academic norms, including research practices, syllabi and curriculum determination in order to reflect a meaningful relationship with indigenous nations and an acknowledgement of a very troubled past, despite the fact that the current generation of scholars may have nothing to do with the immediate suffering of the indigenous populations um, at the foundational term of the Canadian state. So <clears throat> for most university administrators, that kind of call is actually uh, perhaps too radical a vision um, in terms of what can be done on the ground. And uh, for many a department, uh, it too comes forward as destabilizing. Instead, what we see is universities and higher uh, education institutions propose a, a more practical um, and numerically traceable goal, such as increasing indigenous student enrollment and hiring more indigenous faculty and staff. Consequently, indigenization leads to the adoption of indigenous peoples to the current and often alienating culture of Canadian academia, rather than creating a new broader consensus on debates such as what counts as academic knowledge production. So if we were to look at indigenization from a decolonial perspective, uh, we would see alternatively a vision um, that really buys into a wholesale address of the academy in order to fundamentally reorient knowledge economies and uh, <clears throat> that has askance on balancing of power relations between indigenous peoples and contemporary Canadians and thus transforming the academy into something other than what it is now. What I'd like to do in this talk is draw some parallels between the dynamics of indigenization of Canadian ac academia and uh, <clears throat> what we can and cannot do or what we've done thus far 
in terms of forced migration studies, although the scale is different and the context seems to be relatively um, <clears throat> diverse. Nonetheless, I think the dynamic is very, very similar. So rhetorical adoption of an inspirational vision of reconciliation and indigenization in the Canadian context has in fact effects that can possibly deepen the status quo as opposed to contesting and changing it, thus leading to the continuation of the unjust exclusion of certain groups, in this case, indigenous nations, from an academic establishment built on top of their homelands. And I think the, the, the <clears throat> similarities uh, with forced migration studies um, are numerous in the sense that the subject matter of forced migration studies is displaced peoples. And since 1960s, the majority, if not all of the displaced peoples come from the global south. And yet knowledge economies and knowledge production takes place primarily in the global south. And even if it doesn't, sorry, in the global north, and even if it doesn't take place in the global north, the framework that is used uh, is indebted to a certain understanding of the nation state and sovereignty and border regimes um, that uh, <clears throat> prioritize the needs and expectations of um, the, 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 the Eurocentric or a global north oriented model of um, both uh, sovereignty and international law. So, so in terms of the subject matter and what is being discussed, it is outside of the establishment, so to speak, and yet it creates the bread and butter of the knowledge industries and economies um, <clears throat> that constitute the pillars of academic, academic establishment in the global north. And, and, and pretty much the same goes for forced migration studies as it does for indigeneity and indigen indigenization of uh, the academy. So what I propose instead is decolonization or decolonization as method um, in my sense to see further than the stated need to better serve the underserved communities. In the Canadian example, it's the indigenous students and communities and or to better support those whose voice have been uh, rendered relatively silent in the case of indigenous uh, indigenization efforts is the indigenous faculty and staff. In the case of forced migration studies, the common parlance is underrepresented groups, meaning people from the global south. Um, and, and, and so decolonization as method sees much further than that. It's not about including them in the already settled and almost frozen in time establishment, but it's actually allowing for fairly destabilizing and uncomfortable conversations and potential transformation of the entire field. Um, so instead of basically referring to policy measures, um, decolonization uh, should invite us to think of a program for substantive change. And uh, if universities constitute a microcosm of the society, um, traditionally they would have been hostile places both for um, indigenous populations but also in terms of the north-south relations, uh, there would have been very clearly identified power dynamics uh, in terms of the voices and the narratives and the stories and, and, and the kinds of knowledge that is emanating from the global south in terms of the perception of what's happening in the global south, in the global north. Um, and therefore, the, the start of the conversation is not going to be from a comfortable place. It does require acknowledgement of certain histories, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, briefly. So simply including more indigenous bodies or more underrepresented voices or more global South scholars will not and cannot change this legacy. Furthermore, inclusion policies often amount to a vision that ultimately expects those which are included to bear the burden of change. So they are often the ones who are expected to propose curricular <clears throat> inventions um, or transitional justice mechanisms uh, to be adopted to the existing academic and institutional culture. They are the ones who are often expected to leave their ontological and epistemological assumptions and perceptions at the gate of the new institution and adopt and change and translate what they do into the dominant discourse. 
uh, and that is pretty much the only condition um, for them to be included in the conversation that is already ongoing, that is already institutionally formalized, that is already well-funded, um, that is already coming with uh, both rewards uh, as well as uh, stipulations in terms of what is considered as um, <clears throat> acceptable research um, as opposed to um, subversive strategies. So this discourse assumes, of course, that the academy is a natural or at least neutral place in which knowledge is already adequately represented and only further advances are to be made by these newly included actors. So it's almost like tolerating the other which have been systemic, systemically excluded already, uh, as opposed to coming up with new synergies, which are uncomfortable uh, for all parties concerned. And then therefore I'll underline the same phrase, destabilizing and hence potentially trans transformative. And it's not meant to be a comfortable journey. And, and that's what I'm going to emphasize in the remainder of my talk. So suffice to say that in the case of Canadian indigeneity and indigenization efforts, um, the Indigenous inclusion policies have had a very beneficial impact on Indigenous peoples in the acad ac academia, and most notably on student completion and retention rates. And I, for one, know uh, teaching <clears throat> at my home institution in the first 10 years or so, I haven't seen a single Indigenous student, uh, whereas uh, <clears throat> during the last five years or so, not only we do have Indigenous students, uh, we also have indigenous uh, faculty as well as we have indigenous graduate students um, that are joining <clears throat> the, the echelons of, of, of uh, people who are benefiting from higher education and, and um, the state funding that's available to non-indigenous Canadians. Um, however, I'd like to suggest that this is not decolonizing Canadian Academy. It is part of the reconciliation process and indigenous students or faculty benefiting uh, from supports readily available to all students or faculty in academic advising, in health, <clears throat> in accessibility, <coughs> as well as having access to specialized services and receiving additional support um, can hardly be presented as structural changes. It is an inclusion policy. They are vital components of improving the experiences of this particular population group on university campuses. However, such inclusion policies um, aren't indigenization policies, and they certainly do not engage with decolonization of the academia. And expanding this, the, the, the similarities into forced migration studies, I would suggest that including the, the, the voices from the global south or paying attention to publication of pieces related to south-south migration, or paying attention to uh, experiences of refugees and asylum seekers and populations who are affected by forced migration on its own, in my, um, <clears throat> in my understanding, is, is very similar to these kinds of policies that include indigenous students, but it does not amount to decolonization of forced migration studies, which is uh, an entirely different methodological and political debate. So, one of the things that we hear, again, in the Canadian context is Indigenous scholars calls for wider society's engagement in the very process of decolonization. And it often starts, this call often starts with the disruption of colonial research dynamics. What that means is <clears throat> the subject of research want to tell their own story. They would like to change the format of that telling. They'd like to change the questions that are being asked. They'd like to change the funding formula. Canadian universities are publicly funded and most grant money actually comes from the state coffins and then therefore it's also subject to um, national competition. And uh, there are certain set criteria for you to qualify for that competition. And indigenous scholars have been asking for changing of that criteria so that different approaches or different questions could also be rendered fundable and, and therefore potentially publishable uh, in academia. The articulation, the grounding, the, deploy, the deploy, deployment of decolonial and anti-colonial research methodologies um, <clears throat> and recarving new fields of study or even whole uh, fields um, at large uh, 
uh, therefore required the development of specific projects of intervention and transformation, which would then lead to reversal and also assumption of different forms of agency um, <clears throat> and subjectification of research um, and different kinds of actualization of academic knowledge production. So it's a program very much like a political program in the sense that it is open-ended in terms of what you do when you get there, uh, but it carves a very different part of progression and, and, and therefore charts new territory in the academic uh, <clears throat> environment. And I think for forced migration studies, um, there have been certain developments that lead us to um, similar aspirations and, and similar interventions, but on the whole, um, there is still the geographic demarcation of the North-South, and uh, there is the, the historical amnesia of, of what happens in post-colonial societies in terms of colonial legacies, very similar to what happens in contemporary Canadian higher education institutions, uh, while Indigenous students are welcome um, to a building, to um, an establishment, which is actually, um, for, you know, it's a fortification of the resettlement of their homeland. So, so the very dynamic of inclusion, the very dynamic of decolonization itself, when it is only limited to policy, when it is only limited to um, diversity uh, <clears throat> strategies, uh, in effect does a very cleansing effect of histories of suffering, uh, which I think is also applicable to um, <clears throat> um, post-migration studies. Um, just to kind of wrap up the indigeneity business, in the words of uh, <clears throat> uh, the Canadian scholar Elizabeth Carlson, with increasing engagement of settler scholars in theorizing decolonization, and I would like to underline that they are theorizing decolonization, they once again become the chosen agents of change, change that has it as a subject the indigenous population, and then they're doing the theorizing of it so that the practice could be done by others who uh, probably are the already, um, <clears throat> how shall we say, colonized subjects who are being decolonized with their entry into academia. So Carlson argues with increasing engagement of settler scholars in theorizing decolonization, scholars who carry this, uh, this, this type of socialization and the scholarly practices associated with it um, it is no surprise to absorb theory devoid of its connections to practice and to land and to culture. Eurocentric scholarly hegemony venerates detachment and abstraction. Connection to practice is further disrupted by the propensity for those who identify <clears throat> as settlers or contemporary scholars to frame the term um, as synonymous with non-indigeneity rather than centering its set of responsibilities and action as endemic to the discipline. This is a very dense quotation, but it speaks to so many truths in the sense that who is doing the speaking for decolonizing? Who is doing the theorizing? Who is unexpected to do the brunt work? And how is it contextualized? What kind of positionality does one assume when one puts on the hat of decolonizing agent in academia? Um, <clears throat> is it enough to have a commitment or, or can you ground yourself further uh, in terms of disrupting uh, comfortable and established conversations? And um, there's the whole debate about the guilt, the settler guilt um, and giving accounts, the, the cleansing act of decolonizing theory. And then that's, that's even more of a difficult debate. Uh, and I'm not sure whether I'll have time to go into it today, but this is something I think that will occupy us for a while. Um, and so there is the, the, the question about who is doing decolonizing forced migration studies? Who is writing on decolonization? Who is assuming the superior tone in terms of theories of decolonizing forced migration studies? Uh, who is speaking uh, in the language of inclusion? Who is extending the call for underrepresented members of the forced migration studies collegium to be included? Where is that call coming from? 
And what kind of an invitation is that? Who is doing the judging in terms of the, the publication of uh, the submitted papers? Um, who is being included in the publication of um, <clears throat> the, the boutique academia? Um, you know, being the, the, the larger publishers uh, and publishing houses, and I'm guilty as charged. Some of my books are coming from those and others are coming from Global South pub publishers. And that's a very intentional choice on my part, um, to say the least for circulation purposes. Um, but, but who makes these key decisions in forced migration studies pretty much sets the tone for the whole field. And I'm going to give a number of examples uh, in the remaining time. So <clears throat> the, the the ongoing processes by which Eurocentric and settler colonial dominance is actively reconstituted as part of the disciplinary geographies of the field um, is a major concern uh, for forced migration studies, um, whether the scholars from the global north or the global south, or like myself, and I dare say, like Professor Chala, a diaspora scholar who is sitting right on the fence, neither north nor south, but operat operating in both domains uh, with relative ease and, and um, <clears throat> associated responsibility. Um, so there is indeed a difference between good intentions of conscientious scholars who want to be a part of the decolonization effort and the actual impact of their academic activities and outputs, whether these speak to, to power or whether they are part of the status quo, whether they are funded so easily and so lucratively um, that <clears throat> it becomes very normalized um, in terms of the way um, you include intersectionality in your work, in terms of the way you acknowledge that most of the forced migration movements happen in the global south. These announcements become pro forma. And, and, and therefore, they actually mainstream decolonization efforts and then bring the circle back uh, into where it started, which is the centers of power in terms of global academia. Um, Anti-colonial and decolonizing research methodologies, on the other hand, are, are, are required to produce scholarship and ask questions um, relevant to relationally accountable decolonial histories, a task far too challenging uh, for the field of forced migration as it is. The increasing pace at which new literatures on forced migration, refugee and asylum resi resiliency, precarious labor, graded schemes of citizenship, as well as global solidarities is emerging, creates the impression that scholars of forced migration studies en masse as a group are breaking entirely new ground. And this is without precedent. I would dare to challenge that because it is mistaken and this kind of engaged work with very clear focus on troubled histories, solidarity building and anti-colonial strategies have been in circulation for decades. What is new is that <clears throat> the lens shifted and now centers of power in global academia, mainly global north are paying attention to this kind of separate line of work and mainstreaming some of that work, which is very similar to indigenous inclusion, as I talked about in Canadian university campuses. Um, and neither are explorations of methodological interventions revealing the disparity between theoretical content and research practices of scholars in the North and Global South, neither are these new. Seeking to subvert colonialism through articulation of anti-colonial decolonizing research methodologies and extending this discussion um, to scholarly commitments and academic practices of established global academia have long found its way to standard curricula on forced migration, international migration, citizenship studies. Denunciation of settler colonialism as well as <clears throat> its other forms have already become the standard greeting for academic meetings, institutional addressing of the public, and also self-identification of scholars. Indeed, my own email signature includes the following addendum. I acknowledge the land on which York University operates and recognize the long-standing relationship 
indigenous nations have with these territories for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Perdet River. Takaronto is in the dish with one spoon territory and is home to indigenous people from many nations across Turtle Island who continue to care for this land. Now, this is not my ingenious creation. This is actually an institutionally circulated form of address. And we now all cite it at the beginning of many institutional meetings. And I think in forced migration studies, in terms of curricular inclusion of voices from the global south and the, the colonial critique, there is a very similar sense of inclusion of staple items into the, 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 the literature, um, <clears throat> just like this acknowledgement, whether I am taking part in the reconciliation process whether I am decolonizing my curricular activities is entirely different from this ad address that is actually attached to my email. And what's more interesting is many of my students often cite the same text with the change of tribal names and territorial names, depending on where they currently reside, including what is known as the Canadian cottage country. So it's not even an institutional <clears throat> in-depthness, but it's now uh, assuming a personal tone as well. And uh, <clears throat> in the words of Alyssa McCoon and Elizabeth Scarcoch, these are um, what we might call the ethical demands of settler colonialism. And I'm wondering whether we can actually recognize some of these trends in forced migration studies in terms of acknowledging um, <clears throat> the contributions made by certain scholars from the global south by name and by title, and then doing the, the, the greeting at the beginning and perhaps going on with our usual business. Um, so no doubt, sustained critical analysis of power relations, along with the dismantling of inequitable social and historical structures, and solidarity with populations that experience marginalization, dispossession, othering, structural poverty, oppression, exploitation, um, these are all very lofty tenets, many of which are pronounced in the work produced by forced migration studies scholars, North and South. But do these aspirations and aims amount to decolonization of the field itself? That is the question. I would argue that unless we directly address the extractive, dispossessing, and pathologizing impact of mainstream research practices on colonized peoples and communities and lands and knowledges, declarations of distancing academia from, from tainted past do not suffice. Decolonization as method emphasizes other worldviews, but then one has to ask what renders them other? Are we part of that other? Are we the one who's doing the othering? What kind of desire we project in terms of including the other? Is that a cleansing effort? Is that a bowing out of respect and guilt? Or is that a genuine ontological and epistemological commitment that is integral to the way we observe, experience, and decipher the world. Historically speaking, if that kind of commitment <clears throat> embodies reciprocity, rootedness, and honors self-determination of how we know and what we know, and treats knowledge as relational, and does not shy away from accountability for what we say, and seeks connection, and honors the memory and the present of um, <clears throat> insufferable horrors that mark the way things are today, I would argue that's when decolonization of forced migration studies really start, but not with an acknowledgement of the work done by people who live in that decolonized or decolonizing world, and then and, and not in terms of uh, ethically um, <clears throat> expressing our desire to be included in the methodology, but doing the actual work itself is where this conversation should start. And as such decolonization in forced migration studies requires what Margaret Kovach calls situational appropriateness, that's a normative stance, which means that it can only be actualized when the whole context is relevant to the questions we ask and the answers we seek. In other words, we're not just seeing a part of the whole picture, but we're contextualizing and historicizing the experiences of forced migration and their overall systematic 
impact and effects and, and, and significance. So what I suggest, therefore, is a fundamental reorientation of our research values as well as practices. The global academ academia is designed to con <clears throat> concentrate, center, promulgate, cherish, reward, and accommodate certain research practices and forced migration studies and international migration in general. The time, planning, effort, resources, and vigor required for <clears throat> anti-colonial, decolonizing, and relationally accountable research paradigms, methodologies, and practices cannot naturally happen in an institutional setting whereby the status quo is not only normalized, but also presented as historically sanctified. That is to say, you cannot go back and rewrite these histories. You only try to ameliorate the effects of those <clears throat> um, well-trodden historical paths of suffering. So let me give a few key examples from my own work. Um, for about two decades, I am one of the many who has been announcing South South migration um, as the as the focal point of forced migration, and then now it's becoming a recognized field. Um, but we've also been talking about um, leaving aside the nationalistic lens and thinking like the state, and therefore concentrating on hubs of migration. Some of us have Marxist readings and then and, and, and education and political economy and in particular labor relations. Some of us <clears throat> have training in um, theories of globalization. And so it made no sense for us to look state to state immigration per se, other than let's say remittances or uh, wartime exigencies, but one had to look at regions in general. So the South South migration is too generic, but the other alternative has always been presented as country A to country B. And we've been arguing against it for a very long time. Um, another example is Syrian crisis. When I first started working on Syrian crisis, I was truly troubled by the prominence of work that was concentrating on reception of Syrians in Europe. Because we knew in the region that millions and millions were being resettled or basically floating and trying to survive in the Middle East. But you couldn't get edgeways any publication in any of the main journals and forced migration studies concerning Syrians in Lebanon. Um, <clears throat> Syrians in Turkey, we started publishing um, in journals that were Middle East specific, but not forced migration uh, studies journals. I mean, it took about five to eight years before you can seriously shift the lens or, or come up with a combined approach. That is, again, um, signaling the difficulties of, of telling the same story, but from a different standpoint. For you to be acknowledged, even in terms of the, the, the reality of the situation, you have to uh, basically wait five to eight years before you can publish your research in key journals that mark uh, the, the knowledge geographies of, of the field. Um, <clears throat> statelessness, this is something that is really dear to my heart. Um, when I first started looking at it and talking about it, that was about 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, um, <clears throat> the, the UNHCR uh, was involved in developing the, the, the program on ending statelessness. And then the way statelessness was defined was so um, litigation oriented and the whole responsibility was put upon the very states where stateless people were leaving from. And we knew politically that was a very, very uh, tumultuous road and it had very limited applicability. And over the years, especially after the Syrian crisis, as the numbers swell in terms of people who were de facto stateless, then the lens started shifting. But this is something we, meaning scholars from the Global South, have been saying for at least 20 years, if not more, that this is not a specific phenomena, this is a globally reproduced phenomena, and there's got to be a different kind of conceptualization. And I have to specifically thank my um, <clears throat> Indian uh, uh, scholar friends um, from CRG uh, in terms of helping me to find my voice on this issue, because they have done phenomenal work, many of which was not published outside of the, the, the regional domain and only selectively cited, which, which is a whole different debate about citation politics. Um, another key example, unorthodox and fluid models of accommodation um, <clears throat> of, of asylum seekers and, and um, 
mass forced migration uh, movements versus juridification of the asylum processes. All the flagship journals and mainstream publications are squarely concentrated on juridification and convention um, <clears throat> and renditions of con convention and readings of convention and the failures of the, of the juridification and litigation processes um, in the global north. But we do know that 80 to 85 percent of asylum asylum cases are not going through the juridification process, and then they are actually absorbed in uh, through unorthodox models of accommodation. When years ago, um, my colleague uh, Galia Benaria, when she ran a workshop on unorthodox methods, um, it, it was uh, very much um, a conversation of uh, puzzlement for our colleagues in the global north. It was just a normal conversation for our colleagues in the global south. So entering a dialogue, even with Galia's endless efforts, was so difficult because we couldn't even convince the fact that protection takes many forms and it didn't have to be juridified and it didn't have to be taking the form of litigation at a superior court for it to be life-saving or for it to be a part of the daily reality. Um, there are many other examples. Uh, <clears throat> urban refugees is another part of this discussion. Um, <clears throat> I mean, um, th this is something that uh, has been going on in terms of research practice for people who work on the ground in the global south, but it has been an unknown for our colleagues unless they had grants to do field work in the global north. And, and <clears throat> for, for Barbara Harold Bond, the, the, the late scholar of forced migration studies, um, it, was, it was a very, very problem laden area because she knew that that was, that was a, a very integral part of refugee experiences in the global south, which we cannot deliver as, um, as a topic even um, to, to colleagues and publishers in the global north. Um, another example would be um, <clears throat> citizenship. And um, I mean, in terms of graded citizenship, in terms of the fact and visual citizenship, those debates to a degree took place in Europe, but not in the forced migration context, but they are really real debates in the global south in terms of forced migration context. So even the, 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 the terminology that you apply to, to given situations uh, shows su such variety. And for some reason, certain contexts always assume priority in terms of setting the terminology as opposed to others, although numerically, the experiences <clears throat> that correlate with the concepts uh, might be uh, much more dominant. I mean, the experience in the global south, and yet the terminology does not enter the mainstream parlance of forced migration studies. So um, the list can go on, and, uh, and then I don't want to bore you. Um, one of the things that I suggest in my work is that teaching forced migration as part of citizenship and national studies curricula. And this is something that we've done theoretically in our publications, arguing that it is a very essential part of nation building and nation sustenance processes, but included in mainstream curricula is an entirely different phenomenon. Um, the other uh, trajectory that I suggest is including settler colonial examples of cleansing in histories of forced migration. So in effect, creating synergies between indigeneity and decolonizing indigenous um, <clears throat> studies, indigenous populations with forced migration studies. So bringing first world and quote unquote third world examples together um, under the aegis of, of one arching framework. Um, another uh, strategy that I actually um, not only suggest but published on is including forced migration and right, um, right of return discussions in transitional justice debates as well as international law debates. Um, and I think there is a lot, more, a lot more to be done there, but certainly um, this is one field where I, I certainly uh, see a lot of progress happening um, because we've got more and more a brilliant scholar coming out of the African context, coming out of the Middle Eastern context and South Asian context that are contributing or rather imposing their interventions onto mainstream publications. So <clears throat> overall, um, I'm looking at the time, the framing of research, research questions um, and determining what gets funded, published and supported 
um, it, these are essential components of the politics of decolonization of forced migration studies. Um, and I mean, observations from the borderland, which was the title of uh, my talk, I don't think they are borderlands. I think there's, some, there's a problem in terms of how we define the core. And I think we also need a, a different language in terms of what is margin, what is border and what is core. Maybe the core should be shifting to Southeast Asia, or maybe the core should be shifting to Middle East. And then Europe will become the borderland because it's receiving what's outpouring in terms of forced migration studies or maybe in terms of power dynamics, we still want it to be the historical core, but as long as we keep it as the core, then we will basically um, create the platform for the reproduction of the same dynamic in academia in terms of who, who, who has got the say about research funding, topic determination, publications, and, and circulation of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> there's a whole other aspect of decolonizing forced migration studies, which is, um, something that I'm very, very keen on, um, <clears throat> actually not only writing, but also training my students um, and people who are not my students. Um, and, and that's the ethics of witnessing. This is my own terminology. And it includes practices such as research subjects um, taking part in the analysis of the data that corresponds to their experiences. And I just wrote an introduction to a whole collection of refugee voices, uh, which is a London-based production um, <clears throat> and, and a series of productions. And then there, the researcher actually worked with asylum seekers and refugees on the field and wrote the actual text with them. So it was a co-publication. Um, there are other examples of action research, um, so it's not just about the ethics protocol of what you do and don't do, but literally include them in the telling of their own stories. So to conclude, um, <clears throat> in a 2012 article called um, Decolonization as Metaphor, um, Eve Tuck and Wayne Young argued that there's a lot which is unsettling about decolonization, like concur in the context of forced migration studies. Decolonization brings about the possibility of the repatriation of the excluded and their life stories and their understanding of history, which is not the same thing as aspiring for social peace and seeking forgiveness and historical closure. The destabilizing part is a genuine encounter and not knowing what the answer is. It's not uh, an incorporation of what was outside into what is mainstream. It is something entirely different or it's meant to be entirely different so that it's not just a policy for inclusion. And the authors insist that decolonization ain't a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies. Um, in the same way, I argue that decolonizing as method <clears throat> is very costly and often a painful endeavor and not just an aspiration or a public address of goodwill in forced migration studies, or an inclusion, a gesture of inclusion for other kinds of scholarship. The moment that kind of scholarship is other kinds of scholarship by title, um, that means the problem continues. In effect, many of the current practices presented as anti-colonial or decolonizing are in effect incommensurable with the tenets of transformative uh, change. As Tuck and Young um, suggest, because the mentality of colonialism, including settler colonialism, is built upon the triad structure of settler native slave, the, the colonial desire of white, non-white, immigrant, post-colonial, excluded, marginalized, oppressed peoples are similarly entangled in the original logic of historical legacies of supremacy and normalizing the status quo. So the problem I see here regarding the global mapping of forced migration studies, unlike Canadian takes on decolonization as method, I mean, our problem as a field is not so much related to reconciling settler guilt or att attacking settler complicity or undoing the rescue of settler futurities. Um, that's not the problem as a field. However, I do agree with the ethos of subscribing to an ethic of incommensurability, uh, which recognizes what is distinct and what is sovereign 
in projects of decolonization in relation to global movements of dispossession and displacement. So here the conceptual enemy is inclusion of other kinds of scholarship because there is an incommensurability there in terms of our understanding of history to start with, but also the way <clears throat> the political subjectivities have been defined. Unsettling themes within transnational third world decolonizations and critical pedagogies readily come to our aid if we are to challenge the way the present is normalized under the bloody weight of multiple tasks that are still uttered in forced migration studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I have to open my video. Okay. Um, you have to, um, Clemens, could you put me on the video? Sorry, I'm very sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, Nargis for this wonderful talk and uh, sorry I'm trying to okay thank, thank you, you very much for this wonderful talk and um, and it's a very you showing us a very difficult path actually if one wants to embark to a kind of a very unsettling and uh, journey without knowing the um, recipes or without knowing the uh, exact outcomes, but at least uh, knowing the um, attempts and desires for destabilizing the kind of the um, power structures that keep uh reproducing but not only uh with also uh, with a big uh power with a very strong power of co-optation and uh co-optations and um canonizations and then kind of um what you referred as the mainstreaming but also uh mainstreaming taking places at supposedly on the margins and then also mainstreaming that could be also engulfing the quote unquote the borderlands that's what you were also referring in terms of the the, the uh, critical um remarks uh, of that and i think this is this is very important that to trying to get out of the inclusion tolerance and then trying to uh, come to terms, but the very tamed kind of transformations uh, uh, desiring. So I, I mean, uh, we have already several uh, questions that uh, are posed. So I have also my questions, but I will first give the floor uh, to the others, to our uh, audience. Um, you mentioned how the UNHCR had a limited definition of statelessness. Can you elaborate on this? How did it disaffect or affect stateless populations? So I know that your, your work, and I think this is a very good way of uh, talking through your work. That is a question posed to you. You should could add, add, yeah. should uh, I add um, one maybe one? I want to add another one um, because we, uh, I mean, in terms of I'm looking at the time. Thank you very much for this presentation. I would like to know if you could elaborate a little bit more about the potentials of combining forced migration studies and transitional justice studies and maybe give an example of work that is already happening at this intersection. So I particularly gave the floor for these two questions. I know that they really talk to your work that uh, you could, uh, through your work, uh, respond to this. Um, thank you for both of these questions. And I'm seeing some others in the chat and I'm not sure whether we would have time to <clears throat> deliberate on all of them. 
Um, but um, let me start with these two. Um, in terms of statelessness and the UNHCR definition, UNHCR um, has to abide by the legal description of statelessness, which is de jure. And we know that what is considered as a limbo situation in effect amounts to sometimes decade or, or two decades long statelessness where there is no address for right of return and uh, <clears throat> there is no recognition of these uh, subcategories of um, refugee populations in terms of uh, their inclusion in uh, resettlement schemes. So it, it became this blur on the margins and, and, and one of the things that uh, <clears throat> you know, um, there will be no statelessness at such and such date, UNHCR declaration did was, it dealt with the very countries where stateless people emanated from, it's a select number of countries, and it did have some success in terms of securing um, arrangements for right of return. Uh, however, when you look at globally the phenomenon of statelessness, uh, the largest group right now happens to be Syrians. Certainly that kind of strategy would not apply and limiting statelessness to the de jure definition. And as in the case of Syrians, you might say they're not stateless because they have a state, they left from Syria, but guess what? There's no way they can prove they are from Syria. Neither does the Syrian government currently uh, acknowledges their existence or their right of return, but also not even grains of, of, of wheat grow on that land. There's no place to return. So this is millions of stateless people. And, and that's uh, what I was alluding to in terms of limiting yourself to a very narrow rendition of the legal definition of statelessness when in effect, in real life, in action, you're dealing with millions of people and generations of children born into families who are then <clears throat> declared as stateless because their families did not have the residency status. Um, whether you're in camps or you're in quote unquote limbo, limbo, by the way, is a form of life um, in terms of forced migration. It's not a temporary state. And, and we know that for a fact, um, <clears throat> but um, it always happens to other people, other refugees, other geographies, unless you're in the midst of it then it's no longer limbo. It's all you know. And, and statelessness is the only status that you have. So, so that's the one uh, <clears throat> intervention that I could suggest on this issue. Forced migration and transitional justice. I don't know whether we have colleagues here who worked on uh, <clears throat> Ugandan peace process or Colombian peace process or um, the, the Yugoslav wars or um, the, 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 <clears throat> the fate of uh, uh, Sunni populations from Iraq. Oh dear, I mean, this goes to um, the whole business of witnessing and political agency. Um, I mean, the best witness of an atrocity is the one who is dead. And it's very similar to forced migration and transitional justice. Populations who have been expelled with no right of return, who have become refugees and asylum seekers in thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions, are often entirely excluded from uh, the peace process. And there's no uh, consideration of right of return or their agency being taken into account because often they are the ones who suffered most from the conflict and therefore their return would lead to uh, very aggrandized accountability uh, measures uh, which would quote unquote destabilize the post-peace status quo. And so the, the majority of the settled population do not want um, migrants, forced migrants who were expelled, exiled, living elsewhere to return and become part of the transitional justice process. And that on its own again normalizes cleansing, the cleansing impulse. And uh, we see multiple waves of that. <clears throat> and the new work that I'm um, um, hoping to complete um, in 2022, which looks at uh, minorities in the Middle East, is not just a one-time affair. It has been taking place in waves in, 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 in multiple decades. Every time you get rid of yet another population, which is causing a problem for the regime and make sure they cannot return. You establish societal peace, excluding them, redistribute their belongings and their status to some, somebody else who is unhappy and the chapter is closed. And so so that debate about forced migration and transitional justice is a politically very volatile debate. 
Um, and then, uh, as my colleagues from the, the subcontinent know, for instance, the situation of Muslims in India right now, especially um, in the north and the northeast, is, is a testimony to that. Um, there is a categorical exclusion of those who just sit on the margin and who have quote unquote dubious belonging status for them to be included in peace negotiations. Okay, thank you very much. I will be taking another one. Um, and thanks so much for your talk. It gives me hope and energy. This is very nice. Regarding what you said, Hana, you praised it towards the end to move beyond goodwill. Could you say something about how we as migration students in the global north can move forward? Who uh, We who earnestly want to be part of real academic decolonization efforts with integrity, who so many times have professors that are most definitely taking the global north as the given context against which all other must always remain borderlands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a very difficult task and um, <clears throat> no single person can achieve it on their own. Um, but the, the beginning point um, from a student's point of view, um, as well as the, 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 the uh, scholar, is uh, what I refer to as citation politics. So in your work, who are you citing? Uh, what kind of phenomena you're citing? Um, <clears throat> and also um, what kind of historical narrative uh, you're proposing in your discussion of, of key events. So, for instance, uh, in the book on Syrian Exodus, and the title of my book was Syrian Exodus in Context, and that was intentional. It wasn't about European reception of Syrians. It was not. Um, and, and, uh, and so, like, I changed the context willingly, saying, look out, look at the region, try to understand from within the region. And uh, it sometimes produces silences because we talk of things that are not comfortable. We talk of things that are not known for people. Um, I mean, there is a whole, I'm going to use a very heavy language, but there's a whole butchery of area studies where only the, the native informant can know what's happening down there unless you get the scholarship and learn the language and spend uh, some years in doing field work and then you master the local culture. Those kinds of academic divisions of, of knowledge, uh, I think they're brutal for forced migration studies because by definition, that thing is global and regional. And you do need to understand the dynamics and, and the multi multiplicity of overlapping history. So another strategy is um, to keep focusing on the historical and the regional as opposed to country specific. Okay, thank you very much. I will take another one, then I, I, I'm, I put myself. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. You spoke of settler colonial approach, especially when it comes to policy naming bodies, which are all in the global north, vis-a-vis -vis stakeholders that are in the global south. You could please reflect on the researcher and research positionality in the academia. The question about who can research whom, what are the ways in which research scholars can be careful when researching communities that they do not belong to ethnical, ethnically or geographically? And two answers <clears throat> I would like to propose to, to this. One is I'm going to go back to the Canadian context because there's some very valuable work that is based on true cooperation working together between North and South. Um, Canadian funds are, as I said, that these are public funds. And, and when you're identifying research partners in the global South, there's no new research protocol, which indicates that they're not just uh, tagging along with you, but they're organically involved in the development of the research question. And then they have uh, a very distinct status in terms of the termination of the final product. So that changes the dynamic. Uh, as opposed to the money coming from the, the North and the Southerners simply providing raw information. Um, that's one model that could be appropriated in other settings. Um, another example is uh, researchers in the global South. This has been a perennial issue. The funder determines the question. The funder determines the context. So <clears throat> one of the things you do is you propose something to the funder 
and, and then they're overseeing mechanisms as to how you use that money for research and then you produce a report. But at the same time, I'm not suggesting anything illegal, but you develop subsidiary economies of knowledge production. So you send the researchers and the students and then the interviewers out to the field. And with some of their findings, you write the report, but with some of the other findings or the same findings, you also publish something else, which is not addressing the, the, the funders questions only, but dealing with your own questions. I mean, it requires more work, but I've seen it done and, and seen it done beautifully. These are realities of global economies of knowledge production. The money comes from the North, even for workshops. And I think one of the <clears throat> uh, inadvertent side effects of positive nature of COVID is in fact, we can come together without needing much of money uh, and, and, and share information and work together um, albeit virtually, but nonetheless, it brings a certain kind of freedom. Thank you very much uh, for the, um, with the positive effects of the COVID in a way. And actually, this is also a very good example of that. We have not been in conversation for a long time, Nergis and myself, in terms of not in the conferences and that with this kind of the um, uh, distances, but, through COVID actually, that's happening even more often, so that yeah. we were. Uh, but I would like to come back to uh, the question about the um, knowledge economies of, no uh, the global economies of knowledge production in knowledge industries. And, and I, I mean, um, where I am a little bit, um, more pessimistic than you are maybe because of this kind of the um, uh, cooptation potential of those uh, knowledge industries, which we have seen actually with the quote unquote refugee crisis and then the uh, flourishing of uh, forced migration, refugee studies. So if you look at it, many people, what they have been doing it, what, what they have been doing it, and there are now new names on it or new titles on it. And decolonization is also uh, the, um, not only um, ethically, politically correct, but this is, this, presents itself also in a particular way that what you are referring to in terms of the with the inclusion with the little bit of expansion and reaching out or giving examples or including certain case studies from the uh, global uh, global south so if that is also that uh, becoming a kind of a dominant, paradigm in uh, in that uh, form. So I am uh, a little bit worried about in terms of those, uh, how that decolonizing agents, what you're referring to, even beyond that, those global industries, where to locate, how to locate, because if you do not assume an authentic voice that coming from somewhere that it has this kind of the cooptation mechanisms so it does not matter where you are as you were saying that it depends from what kind of a positionality or what kind of a gaze you're talking uh, and it is very much related with the power issue how you access i think this is the uh, this is the crux of it. And this one, I would like to, I have one, two questions in relation to that. One is you were referring to this kind of the, what you call using the uh, data, that is the analysis of data, that is the ethics of witnessing and trying to co-publication, telling their own stories and their own narratives formats. And, um, I found it when this kind of an attitude, uh, when this kind of a, um, attempt of decolonization being mainstreamed, 
then isn't there a kind of a, uh, you're producing particular kind of voices, positionalities, the danger within that to with those uh, um, working not on with. So what you see in the refugee studies now, everyone gives the, the, the either a picture, they, they take the pictures or they write their own stories and then they're put there. So uh, I'm not sure whether this is what you refer to as transformative aspects to give a kind of a, how do you get out of this kind of the um, called data power of mainstream research? Yeah. Yeah. This is one. The second one is that if I, I mean, I find it very important that all the kind of the key examples that you were giving, I mean, in terms of the unorthodox accommodation, I mean, if you looked at it in Iran, Iran had accommodated huge numbers of Afghani people for a long time, and people were not talking about anything about uh, about that only when then the Afghan uh, people in, from Afghanistan were in Europe, then it was in their uh, in their horizon. Similarly with Syria, Syrians in Jordan and uh, Lebanon and that. So it was just basically uh, becoming a kind of a problem. But uh, what you're referring is saying that uh, what you do in your your own practice and saying that I try to teach the forced migration or that statelessness or those kinds of topics within the broader cons the broader uh, and I think that this is what I have been trying to do uh, for for a, uh, for a long time too and trying to theorize why you could not understand the what you're teaching about nation building about citizenship about city making if you do not include uh, uh, those ones, but not as if they were area studies. So it is not like that the having their uh, um, courses on uh, migration on forced migration or refugee studies. So if we take this and continue that, which is very much actually the problems of migration studies in general, that you see here, that is the forced migration, but in general. So uh, my question is that, should we abolish as an area of researchers, as migration studies or forced migration studies? So how do we push this logic, this understanding to its ends? Where does it lead, where does it lead us uh, because I think it is I'm, I'm sure you have a, a experience too that if you go to a citizenship studies conference for example if there are people all the people are talking within a particular canon and it becomes a very different uh, um, your voice acquires a very different weight sometimes it becomes not even audible but uh, it acquires a different kind of way. So if we push that, so should we take, uh, should we abolish migration studies? Should we abolish uh, forced migration uh, studies? I mean, it's two very large questions and, <clears throat> and I, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to think about them together. Um, that's the first thing that I should say. Um, so here's what I have been thinking about is exactly on the same topics. Let me start backwards with the <clears throat> potential abolishment of forced migration or migration studies. That has been a real debate um, for some time, yes. especially among people who do international migration, mobilities and futurities, and people who identify themselves with refugee studies, forced migration studies. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, there, there, there's a song that I love by Ella Fitzgerald. And I, I mean, she says, I'm old fashioned. And then with this one, I think I'm old fashioned in the sense that I see the necessity of including forced migration uh, within the international mobilities, but there is also the reality of en masse displacement and disposition and real political violence. 
um, that requires a different kind of address and accountability. So there I put the International Criminal Law Hat um, and then I say, well, as much as it's part of this larger whole, on its own, it does require a specific form of address as well, and, and perhaps a unique set of protections, immediate protections, uh, particularly in the war nexus or civil war nexus, right? Um, but in terms of what to do with the field as a whole, I think we can only um, <clears throat> hope um, some sort of salvation from what is known as performativity. So we perform different kinds of acts in, in, in front of different audiences. When we are in a citizenship studies conference, um, then we enter the debate uh, from belonging. When we are in a, um, <clears throat> you know, a war crimes crowd, then we enter the debate in terms of dispossession and, and non-inclusion and long-term impacts. And I think that's, that's because of the multifaceted nature of what we are studying. Um, what we do know is that populations who have been subjected to forced migration have always been historically in, in contemporary times seen as exigencies, as collateral damage. And, and there's a trajectory whereby not only they become invisible, but their histories literally become erased, which is not necessarily the case um, uh, in, 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 in the event of uh, migration relative uh, en masse or otherwise um, for, for different reasons. Um, th there's also the expansion of the field, which is now including um, <clears throat> climate refugees or, or, or environmental degradation. And, and I think the field has to remain imperfect um, because social and political life is imperfect. <laughs> and, then so, and then that goes um, into um, trying to think about your first question, you know, the refugee voices business, archiving business. I was um, in my twenties when I first went to um, <clears throat> Greece, um, you know, uh, trying to reach the archives of uh, uh, people who left Asia Minor with the population exchange. And back then that was one of the only archives where you can actually listen to, you know, the, the tapes of the people's voices. And, and I, I I was so fascinated about the fact that they were all kind of put together on, in one place and, and, and fast forward 30 years and in, in my own home institution, we are now building archives. Um, and this has been a conversation uh, for so many years now institutionally because it requires uh, depositing these voices and these narratives and protecting them. It's not just recording, but it's also saving them for future generations. But there is an expectation that once you do that, they'll speak for themselves, but they never speak for themselves. I mean, there are such entangled histories and, and, and scholars who work on oral histories and, and, and politicization of history know that. So archiving itself, whether it's in the form of letting asylum seekers and, and forced migrants writing their own narratives, uh, in addition to your own analysis, or documenting their experiences audiovisually, or recording their voices and virtually protecting them. None of these speak on their own, um, but they, through ways of institutional protection, I think they create spaces, so to speak, <clears throat> in the, in the um, recognized institutional geographies of um, protectional knowledge. And so they, 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 at least they're there now. If people want to use them for, for not just for academia, but for politics, for arts, um, for, for any aspects of social life, they are now there. Um, but again, th there are issues about selection of these voices. Who does the interview? Are these open-ended narratives? Or, or are they contextualized and extracted within a certain um, <clears throat> set of questions? Um, the, the, there are politics of interviewing and knowledge extraction. I know my language is very heavy, um, but um, I took courage from your welcome that, that I can speak in this way because it is extraction um, and it is used uh, for career enhancement and circulation of which we produce for other geographies, right? So there's a subjectification aspect of that. So, so archives are not innocent places. And, uh, <clears throat> and as long as we know that, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with including refugee voices 
but with the knowledge that it's not uh, and 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 no, how shall we say neutral space, yeah. uh, and how yeah. they're used is a different matter. Yeah, I mean there is no shortcut in a way that to just as being called that kind of co-production as sense where their own without uh, reflecting on what that own is at what time in what context and then the moment that it becomes actually part of the industry that knowledge production industry then it becomes really problematic if you don't have that kind of a reflection I think what we take as their own narratives you're very right there is no own narratives without any kind of that kind of without any kind of relationality so it does not exist even and at the archives but also when there is this kind of the extraction is actually happening i like your the heavy uh, terminology with the extraction i think it is uh, very uh, very important and uh, for the keeping the forced migration and migration in terms of the being the old fashion, seeing the merits, but still uh, resisting it to become an area studies kind of um, issue is important. But I will take the last question from actually from CG uh, Calcutta Research Group, uh, Sabia Sachi. Uh, do you think that we should think in terms of legal pluriverse? in order to take into account the legal and anthropological geographies with regard to humanitarian approach and hospitality? Very, very good question. So I think this was our last question. So please. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, as, <clears throat> as, um, as our colleague knows, there are three generations of legal pluralism go going on to fourth. Um, the first generation is the most problem laden because it had a very colonial mark on it. Um, and, and India knows it best, I think, in terms of uh, what it did uh, for, you know, divide and rule and uh, attributing certain kinds of legality to certain subgroups and then and therefore detaching them further and further from the dominant voice of the law. Um, it almost amounted to marginalization. Second generation became a little bit more involved with societal processes. Third generation is international and transnational understandings of um, legal pluralism. And, and I think in that sense, yes, it would really help um, looking at uh, different regimes of uh, accountability and, and uh, um, <clears throat> forced migration um, absorption. And I really think there's a very big problem uh, in terms of having exclusive emphasis on juridification of um, asylum um, and the en masse i mean just the numbers i cannot get over the fact that we can spend and i can understand the merit um in terms of the system's own answerability to itself but we can spend decades about the nitty-gritty of the canadian immigration and refugee determination system when on the whole they accepted what fifty thousand this year <laughs> and you're dealing with another country which accepts five million and, and and the industry the publishing industries basically are replete with hundreds and hundreds of pieces that looks at that 50,000 and their adjudication and the principle of it and the ideal of it. And yet there's hardly anything um, on the other example. That's what really troubles me deeply. And I'm not going to live forever. And I don't know whether I'll see in my lifetime a balancing act between these two different, um, how shall we say, uh, kinds of preferences as to what we attribute importance to and and going back to <clears throat> um, the, the 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 question about legal pluralism, perhaps that would allow us to open up space for other ways of dealing with forced migration and not just through litigation And India is an outstanding example, by the way. And I, I think I, I would not be wrong to suggest that it's not perfect, it's not a heaven, but in terms of the constitutional adoption of and protection measures, 
uh, India is an outstanding example, which to this day, we have to push into the curriculum and it's always seen as, oh yes, that's one good example out there in the midst of this chaos. And what, what is referred to as chaos is, as I said, 90% of the uh, forced migrant population in the world. Aisha, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, I didn't realize. Um, <laughs> okay, just, uh, yeah, just okay. Sorry, yeah. it just, I mean, thank you very much. And uh, I remembered uh, an article of yours where you were talking about the multiple ways of production of statelessness while you uh, the whole uh, academia is focusing on that the kind of the just this jurisdiction of the justification of that statelessness and how it has been made and made produced and reproduced and then the permanent state of uh, statelessness that also you were uh, uh, talking about but i think our time is we could continue um talking about these issues because also these are very um uh, very important very discomforting in terms of academia in terms of our uh epistemologies in terms of our uh, knowledge production um pathways and structures so they are very important uh, points but uh, and they are very much on the uh, agenda but uh, our time is limited and thank you very much uh, Nargis for this wonderful talk for the very your engagement in terms of uh, responding to questions and for the audience for your very good questions thank you very much Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure.